first verse of Galatians chapter 5, the word of the Lord says this, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Father, as we read through this verse, as we discuss this verse, as we attempt to humanize this verse and make it part of our lives this morning, may you be honored and glorified. And so we ask that you reveal yourself to us through this verse, your will for our lives, your desire for our lives, and the freedom that is encompassed within that. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. It's interesting to me as I get started this morning, and many of you are probably just thankful, hey, it was just one verse this morning. That in itself is a holiday, isn't it? I mentioned last week we are, uh, we're going to go through the book of, sorry, the chapter of Galatians chapter 5. We're going to be going through that five weeks. Um, this is the first week, and we're just doing verse 1 today. I'll uh, break it up into a little passages from here on out. But the verse is simple this morning. It was interesting as I was talking to different people this week. A lot of them were saying how it's one of their favorite verses in the Bible or one of the most memorable passages of Scripture that they know. So I'm excited about this morning. But before we get started on Galatians 5.1, one, one of the things I found interesting was when uh, back in January, my family and I took a trip to Disney World for a week. And uh, my son is a huge Star Wars fan. My daughters are becoming Star Wars fans. I actually, I actually caught Kylie watching um, Episode 4 in New Hope, like the first Star Wars to come back out back in the 70s, by herself one time when she had the opportunity to do other things. So maybe she's becoming a convert to Star Wars. I don't know. I've always enjoyed Star Wars. So Disney had bought out the Star Wars franchise a couple years ago. So when you go down to Disney World, you see Star Wars stuff everywhere, especially if you go to Hollywood Studios. And as we were down there over the course of the week, you know, in and out of the parks and in and out of different stores and shops, and you're seeing all this stuff everywhere, it occurred to me, and I said something to my wife. I said, it's fascinating. If you look through these stores, you know, the stores of memorabilia, T-shirts, gear, junk, you know, whatever it is that they sell at tourist trap stores, um, I bet the ratio is two to one of the merchandise that represents represents the bad guys as to the merchandise that represents the good guys. There's, there's more Darth Vader stuff. There's more um, Stormtrooper stuff. There's more of the bad side, the dark side stuff, than there is the light side. And it was fascinating to me when I made that observation and actually looked around. I'm like, you can hardly find Luke Skywalker stuff. You can hardly find Han Solo stuff. But you can pl- find plenty of Darth Vader and Kylo Ren stuff. And and so I started thinking about it and processing through, why is that? Because I am well aware. I'm not a marketing genius. I'm not a marketing expert by any stretch of the imagination. But if there was a demand for the good guys, guess what they'd be selling? The good guys. Disney hasn't made a fortune in an empire based on being stupid in marketing. They know what they're doing. So why? I started to ask myself why. Why is that? I know maybe you're thinking this is weird and random and stupid. But I had to wonder, does it not reflect our society as a whole? Is there something about our society that draws us more towards the dark side than to the light? Or the light side as represented in Star Wars movies? Now I thought about it. If you think, if you know, I've grown up, I'm 41 years old, so I've grown up at a at a weird time, I've seen a lot of changes, and I think no matter when you were born and when you're growing up, you probably experienced the same amount of changes. But what's fascinating for me is the changes that we've seen in the last 10 years alone with some social issues in our society that used to be viewed in a negative light that now aren't. You know, and I thought about it, gender transformation. You know, and, and if you are, you know, my children's age, they know Caitlyn Jenner. I can still remember when Bruce Jenner won the gold medal. Right? And and I bring that up because this is a person who is at the forefront of the gender transformation uh, phase in our society. And he actually only had surgery, he, she, in January of this year. But it was two years ago when ESPN gave Caitlyn Jenner the SB as the Arthur Ashe Person of the Year Award. Now that would have never happened ten years ago. Would have never happened ten years ago. How about marijuana? Right? Like marijuana, it's been five years since marijuana has been legalized in our nation as a, as a recreational drug. Five years. It seems longer than that, doesn't it? It's only been five years. 2012 in the state of Colorado. 
10 years since the 2008 ruling by the state Supreme Court of California that we have legalized same-sex marriages. Again, 30 years ago, an issue that was not even an issue. It was standard across the board. No matter what your political platform was, it was standard across the board. But it's been 10 years. And, and people look at these issues from different points of view. Some people look at the issues and the way our society is heading, heading, and they see it, the progression of a society towards a sophisticated, more accepting, more understanding one to a greater degree of love of all humankind, but not everybody agrees with that. Some see it as a descent into the realm of sin. Many Christians see the dark nature of our society and the church in general and how the church is becoming more accepting of what was once known and generally accepted as sins, not only in society, but also in the Bible. And it sees as we move away from God's laws, many of these sins become more acceptable. And we're going to address that a lot more in two weeks, or three weeks, when we talk about uh, life by the Spirit, the acts of the sinful nature. We'll get into more of that stuff. What I want to make a point of here, though, is simply this. One of the things that all of us, maybe not all of us, but just about everybody, no matter where you stand on any of those issues, love about the man and the personhood of Jesus Christ is this. His willingness to love the unlovable, to touch the untouchable, to treat everyone across the spectrum with dignity and respect. And when we discuss issues like this, those characteristics of Christ better be modeled and emulated in the church and in the lives of Christians as well. 1 John chapter 3, verse 14 says, We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. But you can't call black white, can you? You can't call good bad. The dark side is still the dark side, and the light side is still light side. Just because we sell more Darth Vader stuff and Stormtrooper stuff and Kylo Ren stuff, it doesn't mean that they're the good guys now, does it? I still watch the movie, and the good guys are still Luke, you know, and Leia, Han Solo, Chewie, Yoda. And maybe you're thinking our pastor has officially lost his mind. How in the world does this have anything to do with Galatians chapter 5, verse 1? It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Has the church currently and historically done the same thing with this verse and the concept of freedom in Christ that our society has done with the perceived transgression of morality in recent memory? Have we taken something in this verse that was meant for our benefit, for our good, for our welfare, for the transformation of our souls and minds and our peace, and turned it into something that it was never intended to be? Here's the question I want you to think about. What does freedom look like in the context of a Christian faith? And if you've never thought about this question before, you need to think about this question. You need to let it marinate in your head. You need to let it bake your noodle. Because how you answer this question is directly proportional to how you view Jesus Christ in your life. You see, the verse we are studying today ends with these words. Do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. The historical church, the biblical church even, has done that to a great degree. You see, the yoke of slavery that is being referred to here in, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, is best summed up, I found it in one concordance as I was doing some research this week. It says this. It says, the, bird, the yoke of slavery in this passage is referring to the burden of rigorous demands of the law as the means for gaining God's favor and intolerable, intolerable burden for sinful humanity. What is the yoke of slavery? Adhering to the set of rules that is laid out for us. A, rule, a set of rules that is we are all incapable of adhering to. Paul writes in Acts chapter 15, verses 10 and 11, he says this. 
Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that we, either nor, we nor our fathers have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. Jesus himself said it in Luke chapter 11, verses 46 and 52. You experts of the law, woe to you because, people, because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry, and you yourselves will not lift one little finger to help them. Woe to you, experts of the law. You have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered, and you have hindered those who were entering. So what's being said in these passages? It says that we have taken this law, or the laws mostly in the Old Testament scriptures that were meant to give life, the laws that were meant to give freedom, and we've reduced it to a list of do's and don'ts. And out of that list of do's and don'ts, we have therefore defined our faith. If someone is a true follower of Christ, a true follower of Jesus, then they will be able to check off the list of do's and don'ts. It's not about a relationship. It's about how well you follow the rules. And I say that knowing partially for myself and probably for many of you. If you would honestly recall your faith and the years that you've spent in faith in Christ, when you have experienced or felt success or failure in that faith, was not largely defined by your relationship with Christ. It was largely defined by what you didn't do. I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. I didn't cuss. I didn't sleep around. I didn't do this, 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 and that. So I'm being a good Christian. Good Christians read the Bible. Good Christians pray. Good Christians meditate and fast. The really good ones. There's an interesting... Um, part in the movie called Shaw, the movie Shawshank Redemption. Many of you have seen it. Some of you have not. If you've not seen the movie Shawshank before, it's a movie about people in a prison in the mid-19th century, 20th century, sorry. About 70 years ago, they're in a prison up in New England, and it's a rough life for them. And there's a guy in the movie named Brooks. Brooks is an older fella. He's been incarcerated for 50 years of his life. Most, if not all, of his child and adult life has been spent in the penitentiary, and he is being released. And one of the other prisoners goes to wish him well. And when he does, Brooks, this old man, takes a knife and holds it to the guy's throat, threatening to kill him. Turns out that the reason he is doing this is simply because he's scared to leave. He's been in the prison for so long that he's scared to death of what life is like on the outside. So he figures if he can commit a crime, he can stay in prison. And there's a scene where the other inmates, not Brooks, but the other inmates are talking about this. It's this process of becoming institutionalized, they call it. And the one character says these words. Red says, these walls are funny. The walls of the prison. These walls are funny. First you hate them, then you get used to them. Enough time passes, you get so you depend on them. That is institutionalized. Isn't that exactly what so many of us do to ourselves in our walk with God. We make the rules of the Bible our prison. Then we adhere to them as they turn into our religion, much as they did for the biblical Pharisees and teachers of the law. And anyone who pushes these boundaries, heaven forbid, begins to operate outside of the walls that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt to be true. We turn our backs to them. We tear them down because they're obvious contradictory behavior to our beliefs because of their sinfulness. And this is exactly what Christ was railing against the Pharisees so often for. And yet so often I would say many of us do the same thing. You see, we think we have this good grasp about what freedom is like and what slavery is like. We live in that knowledge that we possess, but is that really the case? Let me ask you a simple question. Does your faith in Christ allow for greater freedom in your life? Or does it make you a slave to your faith? 
I'll ask it again. Does your faith in Christ allow for greater freedom in your life, or does it make you a slave to your faith? Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 through 4, verse 7, says this. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, sli- Greek, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What I'm saying is that as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. He is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God set the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are, alone, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has also made you an heir. We are no longer, we no longer live in slavery in our faith. But in the freedom that comes from being a son and an heir to God's promise. And maybe what you're sitting there thinking right now is, you know what? Like, I've, I, I can only imagine what it's like to be an heir to somebody who really has a lot of stuff, to somebody really wealthy. What, can you imagine growing up with the pressure of being Donald Trump's son? Whether you like President Trump or not, can you imagine the pressure of growing up under that scrutiny, growing up in a family like that? No thank you, right? I would rather be out of that. Not that I would have had the choice anyway. But I wouldn't rather deal with that. I can only imagine the pressure that would come with that. And if you're thinking along those lines, I would offer up the story of the prodigal son. You know the story of the prodigal son. But the story of the prodigal son is the story of a spoiled, arrogant heir to a wealthy landowner that literally went out and squandered all that he had in careless and reckless living in the worst possible way. He messed up big time. And what was the repercussion that he experienced when he encountered his father again? What happened when he saw his father? Was his father mad? Was he upset? Did he turn his back on him? Did he yell at him saying, how could you possibly do something so stupid? Here's what scripture says. His father ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. He said, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him. Get a ring for his finger, sandals on his feet, bring the fattened calf, and kill it. So they began to celebrate. Because obviously the son earned that. Obviously he didn't. You see, the kid didn't deserve this. He messed up big time. How could this happen? I think we need to reconcile in our minds exactly what this word freedom means. You see, Webster defines it as this. The power or right to act, speak, or think as one wants without hindrance or restraint. Another definition says the state of not being imprisoned or enslaved. So when we talk about freedom in Christ, and it says it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Can we truly have freedom in Christ? I mean, I look at the Old Testament. What do I see? I see the Ten Commandments. And what are the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not. Don't do it. Don't do it. This is the rules that you need to live by. I see the book of Leviticus. The third book of the Bible, 20 some odd chapters about a list of rules of things you can and can't do. How to and how not to do them. When I look at the Old Testament, I see rules that are timeless and given over and over of how we should or shouldn't behave. But that's not what it was intended to be. Your faith in God does not depend on strict adherence to that list. If it did, who in their right mind would willingly sign up for that kind of faith? 
Would you? Would I? Matthew chapter 23. Jesus says, woe to you, you teachers of law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Similar to the passage from Luke I read earlier, but a different spot. You clean up the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee. First clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Woe to you, teachers, law, and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs who look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Do we really understand that as a church? Do we really understand that as Christians? Do we really understand that as followers of Christ? We say that we do, but I don't know that we do. What does freedom in your faith look like? How can you know that you are free? Doesn't freedom still come with restrictions? If I am truly free, I can do whatever I want and be free, correct? I mean, isn't that the definition of freedom? I would argue that the answer is yes. Otherwise, it wouldn't be freedom, would it? Maybe that makes you uncomfortable. Maybe it makes me uncomfortable. But please understand that freedom in your actions is vastly different from the consequences that may accompany those actions. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 16 and 17 says this, Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. I think one of the greatest examples, biblically speaking, in my opinion, of freedom is found in the person of Zacchaeus. You all know Zacchaeus. You learned a little song when you were a kid. Zacchaeus climbed a wee, or wee little man. Or out. You know the song. I don't, right? But you know who Zacchaeus was. He was the wee little man that climbed a tree to see Christ. He was walking by. And as Christ was walking by, he stopped. He pointed. He looked at Zacchaeus up in the tree. And I love what Christ said to him. Scriptures say they looked at Zacchaeus and he says, I must come to your place and stay at your house. I must. And Zacchaeus immediately climbed down the tree. And as he was meeting with Christ, here's what Zacchaeus says. Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. There's nowhere in Scripture that indicates that Christ met with Zacchaeus and said to him, here's reality. If you want to be a follower of mine, if you want to get to know me, you need to pay back everything that you've cheated up to four times the amount. You need to give this much of your wealth to the poor. That did not happen. What Zacchaeus said that I just read about giving half of his possessions to the poor, giving back four times the amount if he cheated anybody, was simply a fact of him encountering Christ and that being his natural reaction. It was Zacchaeus' choice. Zacchaeus had the freedom to do as he pleased. But he also experienced a freedom that is motivated by a relationship with Christ. Why did I choose to marry my wife? Now I got all your attention because you're going to say, how is Scott going to get in trouble when he gets home this afternoon? And no, I do not go over this stuff with her ahead of time, so she has no idea what I'm about to say. I didn't do it. I didn't marry my wife for selfish reasons. I married my wife because I love my wife. When I chose to marry my wife, I didn't do it to gain more freedoms or to gain more independence in my life. I already possessed that from a worldly point of view. I could do what I want, when I wanted, how I wanted, wherever I wanted, with whom I wanted. I didn't have to check in with her about things. You see, the reason I chose to marry my wife is simply this. Because my life no longer felt complete without her in it. 
for me to have the best possible version of myself, it had to include her as well. My freedom and joy is founding life in doing life with her, not apart from her. You see, I don't give my wife gifts because she demands me to give gifts. If she did, guess what would happen? She wouldn't get any gifts. Because that's not how Scott operates. That's not how Scott functions. I give her gifts because it brings me joy to see her excited and happy. I choose to give out of my love for Laurie. Zacchaeus chose to give because he sensed that there was something powerful and something inspiring about Jesus Christ. In fact, in Luke 19, verse 6, during this encounter, it says that when Jesus called Zacchaeus down out of the tree, he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Zacchaeus didn't hesitate. Zacchaeus didn't wait around. He got off his butt. He got down from the tree and welcomed Christ gladly. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Psalm 119, 45 says, I will walk about in freedom, for I have sought out your precepts. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Do stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burned again by a yoke of slavery. Now I'm going to close this morning by telling you a story, and it's a story that I've been debating all morning whether to tell you or not. I hesitate in telling this story, to be quite honest with you, because I feel like many of you may look at me in a totally different light. You may lose respect for me. You may not agree with me. And that's okay. I think it's good to be vulnerable from the pulpit sometimes. I think it's important that you understand who your pastor is and where your pastor is coming from. And I would encourage you to hear my whole story before making judgment on me. Here it is, simply this. I never had an alcoholic beverage in a social atmosphere until I became a pastor. Not one time in my life did I ever have a drink until I became a pastor. Now, I did experience communion a couple times at different churches where they use wine, and you kind of take a sip and you go, that's not what I'm used to. See, this is a battle in my life, a battle that I viewed as traditional and influential, one of these commands that I had grown up under, and then I started trail running. And I mean all my life. I mean, I never partied in high school. I never partied in college. I was a designated driver. I did not have an ounce of alcohol, and I started trail running, and I met a lot of people, and I got to know a lot of friends, and there's always alcohol, usually at the finish line. And everybody says, man, I can't wait to get done and get a beer. And I kind of went, you know what? That sounds like fun or that sounds good. I've never had one before. And so I started wondering why it is that I don't drink. Why have I never had a beer before? I went to the Bible, and as far as I can find, you will not find a single verse in the Bible stating that it is sinful to drink alcohol. The closest place you're going to come are Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1. And they talk about the prudence of not getting drunk. And I looked at the reasons that I wasn't drinking. And to be honest with you, they were probably superficial at best. Probably because I had grown up looking at alcohol as a sin. Looking at it as outside the law's of Christ and what he wanted for our lives. And please hear me say that I'm not encouraging you to go and drink alcohol. What I'm saying is alcohol was not a temptation for me, the way it is for many people. If you struggle with it, please do not touch the stuff. Never do it. There are other things that I struggle with that I run away from. I literally run away from them. I will turn my back to it. Alcohol is not a trap or temptation for me. What I realized after much wrestling with God, much prayer, much conversation, was that I had very little justification for my stance other than the self-imposed rules that I had grown up with and the legalism I had learned from childhood. And when I was real honest with myself, when I was real honest with myself, you know what it was why I didn't drink? It was my pride. 
It was my pride. When I really searched my heart, what I discovered was this. That my willingness to have a beer or a drink with somebody then took away my ability or my self-perceived self-righteousness to then judge others who do drink and feel morally superior to them. I'm just being honest with you. And I will tell you that although I don't possess the fondness of alcohol that many, including Martin Luther, the father of the Protestant Reformation did, who is credited with saying many things. One of them was this, whoever drinks beer, he is quick to sleep. Whoever sleeps long does not sin. Whoever does not sin enters heaven, thus let us drink beer. I do not share his affinity. I've probably had a drink after a trail race three times, and what I realize is I do not like beer after a trail run. I don't think it tastes good. I think it tastes nasty and disgusting. I'd much rather have a chocolate milk. But what I've also discovered is simply this. I am much more approachable, and I am much more humanized to those who don't know Christ when I am willing to forgo my yoke of slavery and get beyond my comfort level. And that's exactly what it was for me. And I'm just being honest with you. Because I think we all have those areas in our lives as well. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, it is for freedom that you have set us free. May we wrestle with that concept. And may we not be defined by the yoke of slavery that we so often put on ourselves and allow others to put on ourselves. Help us to be real and true and open and honest with you about who we are and who we are in you. Speak to us. Convict us where we need convicted. Assure us where we need assured. Help us to love you with our hearts and to follow after you and not a set of rules. We ask these things in Christ's name.